Hi, my name is Ava, and I'm a fifth grader here at MSC. Over the course of a school year, fifth grade students have been working on projects based on their systems in the greenhouse. Students may work in one of the four parts of the greenhouse. They can work in the aquaponics, the vine crops, the NFG, or the VIG. My system is the VIG, which stands for Vertically Integrated Growing. My group's experiment was to plant Swiss chard and red vine sorrel in four different spots of the VIG, upper left, upper right, lower left, and lower right. Our experiment could be the solution to some big problems in our world today. The VIG, like all other systems in the greenhouse, uses rainwater. Two big tanks in the corners of the greenhouse collect the rainwater and distribute it to each of the systems. The rainwater flows through a pipe into the VIG's reservoir, where it is then distributed to all of the rows of plants. We add powdered nutrients to the water so that the plants can grow to be bigger and healthier. The VIG is also near one of the glass walls in the greenhouse. That means that it gets a lot of sunlight, which is one of the most essential things for plants. One day, when my group was working in the VIG, we noticed something strange. The same plants grown on the same day, but put in different places, were growing at different rates. The plants on the top were so much bigger than the plants 10 rows underneath. We thought that that was very interesting, so we decided to do our project based on that. Our project was to test where plants grew best on the VIG. In the greenhouse, we made if-then hypotheses. Ours was, if we plant Swiss chard and red vine soil in four different spots of the VIG, upper left, upper right, lower left, and lower right, and measure the growth rate for four weeks, then the plants on the upper right part of the VIG will grow the fastest and be the healthiest. This is what we found out about the growth rate of plants on the VIG. Every Monday and Thursday at recess, we came to check on our, measure our plants. Our conclusion was that the plants on the upper left part of the VIG grew the best, contradicting from our hypothesis. The reason why the plants on the upper left part of the VIG grew the best was probably because they had a lot of nutrients and sunlight. Even though our hypothesis didn't match our results, we still learned a lot. Our project had pros and cons. One pro was that we found out where the best place to grow plants on the VIG is. That will really help people grow plants in the future. Another pro is that we found out which spots had the most bugs or other planting pests. A con was that the best place to grow plants on the VIG was on the top of the VIG. That means that it would be a pain to get the plants up and down. Also, as we learned from our experiment, the plant leaves break when you take them up and down. Our experiment could be the solution to some long-term environmental problems. The VIG is perfect for apartments. First of all, it goes against the wall so it doesn't take up much space. Also, it grows plants quickly and efficiently so that people can always have fresh food. If people knew where the best place to grow plants on the VIG was, they might be inspired to grow more vegetables. That would be growing your own food locally, very locally. Since shipping things is one of the main causes of global warming, this could possibly have a positive effect on global warming. In the end, we realized that with the VIG and our experiment's results, we could do many amazing things. We can solve problems like global warming to making sure we have fresh food. Finally, I would like to thank my friends and my partners in this experiment, Edie, Ali, Gigi, and Yam. Hello, my name is Molly. I am in Barbara's fifth grade class at MSE, Manhattan School for Children. My job as an employee in the, in the NFT, Nutrient Film Technique, had the task to make sure plants stay strong and healthy. The NFT is where leafy greens grow, such as lettuce, kale, or basil. Things were going well until an army of aphids took over. Aphids are small green insects that suck the juice out of the plant's stalk. This affects the plants because the juice is like blood for them. My team slash group wanted to make a liquid or juice that would kill the aphids but not the plants. So we thought we could pull something off of the internet that would help. We figured out that since garlic once grew on a plant, it wouldn't really harm other plants. So we thought we could make a spray called anti-aphid garlic spray. We used garlic, olive oil, water, and a food processor to blend everything together. Once we made the spray, we poured it into a spray bottle. Then we picked out two pairs of plants and sprayed each of one plant. Every week, we take turns coming to the greenhouse at our own recess or lunchtime to spray. At the end of the month, we compared the plants. The lettuce plant without the spray only grew 8 inches, while our other lettuce plant with the spray grew 24. Our barrage plant without the spray grew only 10 inches, while our other barrage plant with the spray grew 30. After this experiment, 
We knew that our anti-aphid garlic spray was a success. We would recommend our spray if you are having any aphid problems in a greenhouse or garden. Make sure your, your plants stay strong and healthy. Molly Warner. Hi, my name is Chris, and I'm 10 years old, and I'm in fifth grade. And this is how I came up with my project idea. Well, everyone was talking about the aphids and all the plants being eaten up, so I thought, we should really stop some of the aphids. I also thought, parasitic wasps can stop aphids, and ladybugs can too. Another thing I thought was it would be cool if we had a race. Which could eat more aphids, ladybugs or parasitic wasps? <laughs> Since ladybugs eat aphids and parasitic wasps kill aphids, which way is faster? Since I work in the vine crop system, we experimented on the big plants in the vine crops. In case you didn't know this, in the vine crop system, we keep the plants longer. This benefited us because we needed a couple of weeks for our project. That was also good for the ladybugs, parasitic wasps, and aphids because we wanted them to feel comfortable, not make them feel like test subjects. They could also walk around the plant and then eat the aphid for a meal. It was like a regular scheduled day. But there were also things to put in the project to make it work like the hypothesis, and after a few days, we decided this was the best one. If we put 10 aphids on two plants, the ladybugs will eat the aphids faster than the parasitic wasps will kill them. But there was still more we needed to put in the project, like the procedures, and this is how they went. Step one, pick two plants to use. Step two, on each plant put 10 aphids. Step three, on one plant put 15 ladybugs, on the other plant put 15 parasitic wasps. Step four, every week check on the data. Step five, every week check on the project. There was also the data analysis page, which went something like this. Week one, ladybugs 10, parasitic wasps 10. But the ladybugs and parasitic wasps were mostly tied in the race. Like one time, the parasitic wasps had the lead, but then the ladybugs took the lead by two. But then the parasitic wasps tied with them again. But on the last day of data, the ladybugs got so comfortable that they laid eggs. And one of the eggs hatched, into a larva, and a larva eats a good amount of aphids, so that made the ladybugs win the race. But here are the pros and cons of the project. Pro, it was super fun working on this project, and I learned a lot of things. Con, it was very hard keeping track and taking care of the data. Pro, now we can t tell people that are having trouble picking over parasitic wasps and ladybugs that ladybugs are actually the right choice. Con, it was very hard making sure that nobody messed with our project. I think people have been struggling with aphids for a long time, and then they use ladybugs to help. Our project was connected to that problem, but we also wanted to give the parasitic wasps a chance. But our data proves that ladybugs are actually more effective. My name is Erica. I just turned 11, and I'm in Hillary's fifth grade class. My group helped me with what I'm about to show you. I'd like to dedicate this speech to Mariah Garcia, Ainsley Bouquet, Juliet Bruce, and Leila Knight, who also helped with this PowerPoint. Our project was called the Tilapia Fish Experiment. We have a greenhouse on the third floor roof. We harvest our own fish and food slash salad. It all started when one, of our when one of my classmates asked Layla, how much do the fish weigh and how long are they? No one knew. So we decided to do an experiment to catch and release the tilapia and write down the lengths and weights. Our materials were fishing nets, a scale, and a measuring table. It would have been helpful to redo the project because for all we know, we could have caught the same fish more than twice. Other than that, we have some warnings and do nots that we learned in the process. Here they are. Don't put the fish near the power outlet or the water and the fish tank will stop running. Don't keep the fish on the measuring table or on, this, or on the scale for more than five seconds. Don't keep the fish out of the water for too long or they'll die. Don't put your hand in the aquaponics tank at all times or the fish will bite. Don't let a fish jump out of the water. If it does, grab it as fast as you can and drop it back in the water. We had four steps to our procedure. Step one, we take the plant tables off of the aquaponics tank. Step two, we take out the nuts and prepare the measuring table and electronic scale. Step three, we take turns with the scale and measuring table. Step four, after we're all done fishing, we put away the nets and clean up. In conclusion, our longest fish was 14 inches by the end of our experiment, and the heaviest fish was two pounds. It's helpful for us to record data because then other groups in other classes, or in my class, can use their data for their projects. Even though we had fun coming up for lunch and recess, 
We learn, most importantly, that a small space like a greenhouse can be a big environment for plants and animals. We also learned that on Mars, the people who live there could have a greenhouse with an aquaponics tank to provide them food. The last thing we learned was that tilapia are freshwater fish. It's good to farm tilapia because they don't need as much space as other fish do, like puffer fish. Tilapia also grow faster than puffer fish, so you can harvest them sooner. My name is Luca. I'm a fifth grader at MSC. Is it possible to mass produce sugar with no chemicals or preservatives? In one of our fifth grade greenhouse experiments, we discovered that this was possible. Our experiment used our, our greenhouse's irrigation system named the vine crops. The vine crops works by, a seri by spraying water and nutrients onto plants through a series of tubes and nozzles. We noticed that some plants were growing slower than others, so we wanted to see if we could speed up their growth. We came up with and tested several ideas, including watering the plants with warm water. The plants of this experiment were stevia. Stevia is a plant that has a sweetener in the leaves, so when we irrigated it with warm water, not only did it grow faster, but it also produced more sweetener. For about five weeks, we measured and recorded the, this a stevia plant. The data showed that warm water in the reservoir improved the sweetener production output. Our conclusion was that warm water works. An internet study shows that 20% of obesity in America is from artificial sweeteners. My vine crop group believes that if we could produce a sweetener without any chemicals or preservatives and reduce the amount of artificial sugar consumed, we could have a positive impact on obesity. One of the challenges going forward would be extracting the sweetener from the stevia plant. In our greenhouse, we do not have a method for this, and I'm not sure it would be possible to do this on a massive scale. In our experiment, the data showed that warm water in the reservoir had a positive impact on the stevia plant's growth. It would be interesting to test this on other plants and see if we can get consistent results. Thank you. Also, I would like to thank my partners, Finn, Jeremy, and Yale, who helped me with this project.